Okay, uh, if I'm not speaking loud enough, please tell me and just raise a hand. I'll try to speak a little louder I speak quietly. Um, the title of my talk today is Tissel Posthumanism in the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Uh, during this presentation, my aim is to open up a discussion about posthumanism. Uh, I know a little bit about it, but I'm not really an expert. I usually teach posthumanism by reading and discussion. I, I don't teach this as a lecture usually. I don't even know if a workshop will work for this. It's, it's a rather deep concept. So usually people go away, read, come back to class, we talk about it. It's only my fit. Another thing is this presentation is very quote heavy because I'm trying to get a lot of thought into a little space of time. The point again is discussion. TTT, teacher talk time, is prevalent in the literature on best teaching practice, but hasn't progressed much to actual presentations. So if you want to interrupt me, go ahead. I don't care if we cover all my points. We probably won't anyway. OK, so the Fourth Industrial Revolution brings together three major concepts, digital systems, physical systems, and biological systems. They say it will redefine what it means to be embedded in this world. So, rhetorically speaking, what does it mean to be embedded in this world vis-a-vis -vis digital, physical, and biological systems? When I was first asked to present here, I really thought, what am I going to talk about? Because I'm the theory guy in DSM. I'm not the tech guy. I discuss new theories. I thought, a few years ago I did an article on basically multimodal literacy and interpreting video games. I thought maybe we could adjust this and talk on that, but it doesn't really deal with the Fourth Industrial Revolution. So I start going through the courses I teach, curriculum and methods and other. I was looking for something that might have a reading that relates to the Fourth Industrial Revolution and globalization of world Englishes, social justice and English language teaching, as one reading on post-humanism, which deals with some of the same issues. New theories take time to absorb. The amount of time varies, but it's somewhat akin to culture shock. Uh, when, I, when I teach the methods course, and we go into the post-method approach and the paradigm, sometimes when people first read Kumarva de Velu, they resist it. Then two or three weeks in the course, they're like, yeah, that's what I do. And they start accepting it. Well, this might be the same, so you might not really like what I talk about today. So th there's this process of a first encounter, and there's often resistance, and there's settling time, then there's a, a recognition of similarities between this and other things you might, other readings or other things you might do, acceptance or rejection, perhaps you'll embrace it, but you might not like what you're going to hear today. <laughs> but you might like it later. <laughs> Okay, posthumanism and Tiesel is mainly being addressed by Alistair Pennycook. You might have heard his name. He's the guy who wrote a posthumanist, no, critical applied linguistics in the early 2000s. Uh, now he's, last year he came up with posthumanist applied linguistics. And this presentation is basically a condensation of his thought and a bit of Now he's theory heavy and application light, which is a problem because you read it and you go, yeah, that, that makes sense. He doesn't really tell you how to apply it in many ways at all. But you are experts in your own domain, so you can figure it out. We'll, we'll bring about the concepts, we'll raise the issues, and perhaps we can get into some of these today. So it starts with the idea, so as another said, what might happen if a viewpoint on the world could be elaborated that would not situate all things in relation to humans. Posthumanism, the post is a reaction to humanism, especially rationalism and Cartesian dualism, the whole mind-body split. A variant term is transhumanism. Transhumanists focus on ontology, theory of being, the change to the notion of chance. Trans. So it also focuses on the in-betweenness of it all, neither human nor not. So in-betweenness and Deleuze's concept of becoming are good terms to keep at the back of your head throughout this presentation. Um, there's always two ways. Uh, now we're getting into the theory here. A 
key concept in post-humanism is voice as assemblage. So what they're saying there is, is my voice is not just my voice, but it's everything, well, it's partially Bakhtin, Bakhtin's notion that when I speak, I speak with the entire history of my words and their history in me. But it's also possibly possible to think of all the things in the environment that are contributing to my voice. Right now I'm speaking through a microphone. The acoustics of this room affect that voice. Everything together is voice as assemblage. Now, because this is quote heavy, as I said before, and because I don't like reading too much, I'm going to have you read the quotes. Now, th this also has the advantage of meaning you have to pay attention. Because the mic will pass around, and if the mic comes up when a quote comes, I'll ask you to read it. So post-humanism, could you begin please? You might have to turn on the mic. <clears throat> Oh, and the, the speakers are in the other room, but that's part of the voices assemblage. <laughs> uh, Post-humanism may refer to a range of concerns, from a questioning of the centrality and exceptionalism of humans as actors on this planet, or the relationship to other inhabitants of the Earth, to a reevaluation of the role of objects in space in relation to human thought and into action, or the extension of human thinking and capacity through various forms of human enhancement. That's a lot of issues, and could you please pass the mic? That's a lot of issues. So, the decentering of the human as the focus and object of inquiry has led, I'll just read this one, has led to the emergence of an object-oriented ontology, what's called OOO, which is a theory of being ontology that moves beyond the cybernetic triangle, the cybernetic triangle is human, animals, and machines, toward a flat ontology. They're trying to approach a flat ontology in research that doesn't privilege the, any item in the research assemblage. Treats everything equally. This, this was bogus to first propose this. Now, a flat ontology is extremely tricky to maintain because it's a human that is speaking. Mm. Nonetheless, there's something gained by trying. Trying to think of everything involved in interactions. Uh, Brad, Brad, Karen Brad came up with a kind of complex theory in meeting the universe halfway. She's a very important figure in new materialism. Uh, she has this idea of an interaction. Rather than interact, interaction, everything works together. Uh, and it's basically a reversal of causality. So rather than me as a human operating on things in the environment, things in the environment also have a causal aspect. That's basically the same. So basically, they're just saying objects have agency. Uh, but also digital matter. And digital matter has a lot of agency. But now, could we, who has the microphone? You passed it on? <laughs> it's hot potato. Post humanist research also focuses on continuity between the human and non human. For some post-humanists, this means focusing on how cybernetics, biotechnologies, prosthetics, and computerized communication devices are reshaping human cognition, embodied experience, and relations with the wider world. Some overlap with some earlier concepts. Oh, and John, you can read. All right. A human's role is the religious human agency focusing instead upon how assemblages of the animate and inanimate together produce the world. Thank you. Uh, we'll just... Well, assemblages describe the way things are brought together and function in new ways, and a way of thinking of consciousness, cognition, and language. All we understand is distributed through a number of agents. Now, before we dismiss this quirky theory about agency, when you first encounter it, it's like, that's just wacky. I've gone through that too. But who's next? Well, I can't <laughs> Thank you. Who well, wants to ask questions such as, does a chair have agency? Or can a pencil think? Or not really worth pursuing? Unless we are really prepared to radically change what we mean by agency and think. 
But trying to understand what Lord Jack may have as part of our thinking and doing and language, as part of our vibrant assembly, and asking what role the person might play in the broader process of cognition, become more interesting. Yeah. And we need more uh, researchers. Thanks, Edie. Thank you. Which one? Uh, no, we need to. Second one? Yeah. Uh, we need to consider the ways in which our lives are entangled with tables. The ways tables are part of uh, momentary assemblages, that include people talking, talking, iPads, croissants, oh, sorry, oh. Yes, the food. <laughs> Should be the first five questions on your handout. I kept the quotes here just in case you want some more background information. So maybe talk with a partner. Sure, talk with a partner.
Yeah, I didn't know whether to go next section or just wait. <laughs> some, people, some people don't even care about it. Well, yeah, it's the problem with the topic too. That's good. Yeah, so that helps. Okay, yeah. Who is the topic in the paper? It was actually about uh, 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 Plants aren't inanimate, right. <laughs> but they're just very slow. <laughs> yeah. I'm supposed to. Yeah, I'm debating whether to just let people. I think they'd like a break. They probably don't want me to start talking again because if I start talking again, then I introduce the next section and just wrap it up. A lot of people talk for five more minutes and then wrap it up. So could a layman understand that paper? No, that was uh, that was the most weird thing. I mean, I feel like I meant a layman in your area, but no. would I get anything from it or? Yeah, probably. Um, I mean, we had most of the stuff on just kind of like a couple of paragraphs in the letter here, you know. Uh, but yeah, thanks. cognition and there were a few questions to talk about one, one of the more interesting things is cognitive scaffolding that which is the second set of questions how, how are you using digital tools to scaffold learning just something to think about we won't think about it today but you can do it in a, if you're really bored uh, distributed knowledge gets into language which actually language has been distributed for a long long time when you think of it where does a language exist it exists everywhere it doesn't exist in one place you can say it's in the dictionary, but then it's not. And each user has an idiolect and uses it in a very unique way. Uh, then there are some things about... Uh, we'll skip it. So just to the end, if you like emotions, there's, there's an interesting book considering emotions in critical English language teaching. As far as new materialism, it, it deals with sticky objects and some affect theory, so it, it explains it very clearly and it's very practical. If you're interested in new materialism in plurilingual classrooms, I have a chapter coming out at the end of this year, hopefully. It's not being, it's still in editing. And I think that's about it. So we'll just let you adjourn to the next thing and we'll see you later.